Okay, I had a couple of things before I start. I am going to be reading this off my phone, like the filthy millennial that I am, um, <laughs> because I haven't had time to print it. But also, a little bit of a disclaimer, I did come up with a title based on a vague memory of the book, um, and when I came to reread it, she doesn't actually talk about Dagon all that much, so that anyone here specifically for Dagon content will be disappointed. Um, but yeah. We all know who H.P. Lovecraft is by now, author of such famous stories as The Evil Clergyman and The Terrible Old Man, as well as some lesser-known works like The Call of Cthulhu and The Mountains of Madness, um, also an innovator in the field of naming your cat after racial slurs. Um, he has had a pretty broad influence on the fields of horror, fantasy, and science fiction. And Rosanna Emrys, whose name I'm probably pronouncing completely wrong, um, has unfortunately had a bit less of an influence so far. Um, but she's got um, her response to Lovecraft comprises a novella, The Litany of Earth, and two novels, uh, Wintertide and Deep Roots, which are responses to um, mostly the shadow of Innsmouth, um, although the second book, Deep Roots, does focus on um, the fungi from Yorgoth, which are the subject of his frankly atrocious poetry. Um, so I'm focusing mainly on The Litany of Earth and um, Winter Tide, which I feel like I've said wrong before, um, but or didn't mention. Um, sorry, I'm rambling. Um, but um, there, because of their connection with Shadow of Innsmouth, there's more of a direct engagement with his sort of coastal-based folklore versus sort of the extraterrestrial stuff. Um, I think that one. Okay. So a few little details about. Um, both the authors and sets of stories. This bit, just a little incidental detail. Um, the Shadow of Innsmouth, uh, briefly summarised, um, was inspired by his own visit to a decaying seaside town, and the narrator is kind of a self-insert who shares some of Lovecraft's uh, own parsimonious travelling habits, according to S.T. Joshi, who I'm also probably pronouncing wrong, um, and, as I said, the, the story is supposedly a warning on the dangers of miscegenation, but the narrator visits a famously spooky town, um, lures a homeless man into an alleyway by brandishing a bottle of whiskey as if it's a bag of dog treats. Um, the homeless man, by the way, is apparently 96, according to the story, so I'm not quite sure why he's taken entirely so seriously. Um, this guy tells him a spooky story about weird cults and people having sex with fish and all kinds of nonsense. And then during the night, the narrator hears some spooky noises in his cheap hotel and on that basis decides to start battering down doors and leaping out of windows in the middle of the night like a normal person. Um, and then once he leaves Innsmouth, he phones the cops, gets the whole town arrested and put in a concentration camp like a normal person would do. Um, and then in the final paragraphs of the story, he starts to realize his own connection to Innsmouth um, and sort of starts to look forward to becoming the quote-unquote other that he so sort of detested before. And Lovecraft himself did not have a particularly high opinion of most things, but he didn't like folklore all that much. Um, despite arguably spending his entire literary career creating a body of folklore that much better writers are still using about a century later. In his conception, folklore is a symbol of the monstrous other, something reserved for lesser races, barbarous tribes, and superstitious simpletons. It is integral to most of his stories, not despite this, but because of it. Mark Fisher, I think is on the next slide. No, that actually is my favorite description from the whole story. What does that even mean, <laughs> and how is it scary? Um, Mark Fisher, The Weird and the Eerie. He describes the allure of weird fiction as being a oh, it twice. The fascination for the outside, for that which lies beyond standard perception, cognition, and experience. In Lovecraft's case, though, this only tells part of the story. The horror for the Lovecraft is in the meeting of the inside and the outside in the rational being infected with the irrational. There is an element of fascination for the outside, but that's only in service of the prejudice against it. And Fisher goes on to describe the sensation of the weird as a particular kind of perturbation, 
a sensation of wrongness, a weird entity or object is so strange that it makes us feel that it should not exist, or at least it should not exist here. Yet, if the entity or object is here, then the categories which we have up until now used to make sense of the world cannot be valid. The weird thing is not wrong, after all. It is our conceptions which must be inadequate. And this, I think, is what lies at the heart of the shadow of Rinsmouth. It makes a story almost take on a bit of a different character. It's the story of someone going through the process of this kind of realization that their conception of reality has encountered the weird and that and in the face of the encounter, their worldview has to be radically altered in order to accommodate it. And everything which they thought to be alien and horrifying is discovered to reside within instead of without. And the cognitive dissonance brought up by the discovery is, according to Lovecraft's framework, enough to send someone mad, although a more normal person might be able to deal with it. So Lovecraft's essay, Supernatural Horror in Literature, um, is not on the next slide, um, is, well, it's a fun read. I recommend you all go and look it up, because aside from it being mostly a recount of some books he likes, interspersed with frankly ludicrous amounts of racism, um, it's, it shows that he pretty much would have hated what's been done with his work since he died, which, good in my opinion, um, the general thesis of the essay is that you have to be really super smart to understand horror and that the people who don't like it are vapid and unimportant, essentially. Um, he, decries, he decries a naively insipid idealism which deprecates the aesthetic motive and calls for a didactic literature to uplift the reader toward a suitable degree of smirking optimism. And later, we may say, as a general thing, that a weird story whose intent is to teach or produce a social effect is not a genuine tale of cosmic fear. How he reconciles that with the fact that his story is supposedly a warning against the dangers of miscegenation, which if that's not trying to teach or produce a social effect, then I don't know what it is. Um, how he reconciles these things, he doesn't go into, but um, these quotations reveal a lot about the way that he views his own writing and the way that his sort of upbringing and privilege are reflected in it. Um, Victor Laval's novella, The Ballad of Black Tom, um, goes into this a lot more effectively than I can do in this presentation, and is also generally fantastic. Um, but in common with Emerus's writing is the idea that for a lot of people, no eldritch terror can be worse than the systemic bigotry cultivated by Lovecraft and his ilk, and often the so-called monsters can provide a welcome escape from the all-too-human horrors of the everyday. But for Lovecraft, the writing of supernatural horror is all about creating an atmosphere. And in the essay, he suggests that the true weird tale has something more than secret murder, bloody bones, or a sheeted form clanking chains. A certain atmosphere of breathless and unexplainable dread must be present. Which I'm not, again, I'm not entirely sure he does do that all that often because he just describes things as unexplainable rather than not being able to explain them. He just says, oh, it, it's unexplainable. Oh, I, I can't describe it. <laughs> so, Emrys quite sensibly deviates from Lovecraft's original sort of background for um, the shadow over Innsmouth. Rather than the whole town being persecuted because of one sort of xenophobic maniac, the Innsmouth folk end up in camps because of a series of religious purges against what she calls aeonist communities. Um, this is her term for the religious practices drawn from Lovecraft's canon of gods and monsters. Um, and with the advent of Japanese internment, a few years later, the Innsmouth folk are mostly forgotten. The stories follow Afra Marsh, one of the last two from Innsmouth to survive the camps, the other of whom is her brother. Um, and in the first story, The Litany of Earth, she is reluctantly working for the government that persecuted her, and she's sent to infiltrate um, an Aeonist sect to determine whether or not they're a danger, which ends up not being the case because of the way that they sort of interpret the books. So they um, believe that they can transform much the way that Lovecraft's narrator does, um, but because they don't have a personal connection to the town, um, uh, Emerus, obviously, she 
um, sets it out as that the Innsmouth folk are a subspecies of human. Um, there are the people of the water, so the Innsmouth folk, and after a human lifespan, they sort of go and undergo metamorphosis and um, go into the sea, whereupon they live for thousands and thousands of years. And then there's the people of the air, who are regular mortal people who live on land. And then there's people of the earth, who sort of a secretive underground people who aren't really seen in the stories much at all. And I believe they come from a different writer. Um, so I can't remember the name of now, and I did not write it down because I'm a fool. Um, but yes, in Winter Tide, Afro is sent to Arkham, uh, which is one of Lovecraft's sort of towns, to find communist spies at Miskatonic University, another of Lovecraft's things. And as she tries to access the universities of collection of books and journals that were sort of expropriated from Innsmouth after they were all thrown out, she once again encounters the cultural prejudice against the Innsmouth look as described by Lovecraft. That's the next line. Uh, queer narrow heads with flat noses and bulgy, starey eyes that never seem to shut, and the sides of their necks are all shriveled and creased up. Emerus, um, Sorry, I have a paragraph missing in my script. <laughs> but um, So this is one of the aspects that she does take from the original, um, other ones being Obed Marsh, a character from Shadow of Innsmouth, is sort of the patriarch of her family, and he now sort of lives under the water. Um, and there are various unpronounceable creatures from Lovecraft's other stories. Um, she does sort of forego the esoteric order of Dagon, um, and does explain some more unsavory aspects of Lovecraft's version of the Innsmouth folk as being blood libels that led to the government persecution. She does um, also keep some, some aspect of the pantheon mentioned in the original, in original is in, excuse me, the original Innsmouth story, Mother Hydra and Father Dagon, who are prayed to, um, and she adds figures of worship from elsewhere in Lovecraft's mythos, such as Cthulhu. So, um, Tracy Beeler, in the essay The Innsmouth Look, Lovecraft Ambivalent, Ambivalent Modernism, characterizes the Innsmouth look as an active process, as well as a collection of physical features. Through the lens of Franz Fanon's black-skinned white masks, she characterizes the Innsmouth look as resistance to racial othering and objectification, as the observed other looking back with eyes that never seem to close. In Lovecraft, the Innsmouth look reveals a pervasive suspicion on the part of the narrator that racial otherness cannot be safely objectified or contained. And the, through this lens, the Innsmouth look signifies several things, othering and prejudice on the one hand, but also power. They are stronger than so-called regular humans and more resistant to cold. It signals to, agree, to a degree that they possess esoteric knowledge and a deep understanding of the scope of time and the transience of history. Their natural lifespan, as I've mentioned, is measured in millennia if they're not put into concentration camps and killed. But yeah. um, this could le easily lead to an indifference towards the ephemeral, and in some cases it does, but the ritual practices that Emrys has constructed primarily involve a level of introspection and empathy that seem to stave off this indifference to a degree. Um, and I have a quote here, like a passage that I'd like to read out, um, because I think it it does a lot to explain sort of the nature of the kind of ritual magic that is part of the fabric of life for the Innsmouth people. I've got it up here. Should we? There. Okay. Look to the stars. Pray. Confess. Listen to the cosmos and to each other. I did as he bade, leaning back into the sand to watch the sliver of infinity that we'd opened. Cool light spilled through, magnified to visibility as it reflected through the falling snow. Above, hidden, the moon lay crested by sunlight and shadowed by the earth. Most of the sun's other worlds lay empty this eon, but some had once borne life native or invasive, and others would bear it again. Distant suns, too, attended worlds that bore or would bear life, and stranger minds waited at the void's edge. Darkness and cold would take them all, and the stories of most would not survive our own suns. No meditation on cosmic humility could keep me from caring whether Audrey died tonight. 
I turned my gaze away from the stars and moved to sit beside her. So there are a lot of things to unpack in that quote. Um, but the sort of the diametrics set up are quite clear. Emptiness weighed against life. Tranquility weighed against the storm outside. The human weighed against the universe. And com contemplating these things allows Afra to choose what is important. And the element of choice is crucial. Magic is on some level a performative practice. By saying a thing, you make it so. The magic and folklore are religious and spiritual practices that fall under the broader umbrella of aeonism can be used for good or ill, or neither. But in Afra's case, her beliefs build toward a kind of radical compassion, knowing that caring is meaningless in an uncaring universe, but choosing to do it anyway. Now, she says in Winter Tide, when the universe doesn't care, someone has to. If we don't care, we lose ourselves. In this compassion, there is, as well as defiance, an act of self-preservation. And Amaris's writing, too, is an act of self-preservation in a sense. Within the world of the story, the people of Innsmouth and Earth more generally depend on beings from other worlds to preserve their stories after the sun goes out. And in writing these stories, as a queer woman, Emrys is ensuring that her community is represented and carried forward by the Lovecraftian canon itself, something which the old guy would have hated. Um, in this sense, her work could be seen as a sort of moralizing story that he complains about, but more than anything, it's simply that her writing reflects her reality in the same way that Lovecraft's writing reflects his. The only difference being that Ruthanna Emrys is not a paranoid bigot, thankfully. Um, one thing I am unsure about is the way that Emrys makes use of some of Lovecraft's language. The outsider in Wintertide is a sort of extra-dimensional entity that takes up residence in Afra and some of her companions, gradually attempting to take them over after a botched summoning. It's described variously as a corruption and a taint, a hungry presence that seeks to devour and destroy. And removing the presence is described as cleansing tainted blood which ends up bearing an uncomfortable similarity to Lovecraft's anti-miscegenation rhetoric in a way that doesn't seem terribly effective if it's intended as a sort of reclamation of that kind of language. So, to conclude briefly, at the core of Lovecraft's worldview and the folklore that he created is an almost instinctive nihilism in the reaction to the knowledge that the universe is ephemeral and incomprehensible. Emerson's response to nihilism is radical compassion, compassion as an act of resistance against an uncaring world. When the universe doesn't care, someone has to. To respond to nihilism and indifference with compassion is extremely powerful. But I suppose the question that I've been asking in this paper, and I don't know if there is necessarily an answer to it, is can the things we extract from Lovecraft's work ever escape their origins? Thank you. Do you want me to? No, I won't go. Yeah, go straight. Yeah. Go straight into it. Jack goes to university. <laughs> this ain't no parroting. I aren't um, no pirate. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, escape. Thank you. <laughs> Dead seagulls, the only bird round my neck. Dead sirens, the only mate on my deck. This only costs you 20p. It used to only be 1d. And that's how long Jack Silver's been staffing this sideshow as a sailor laughing. 
in my famous case on Clarence Pier, where the people of Portsmouth thought me weird and projected all their hate and fear into my slot along with their money. Scream if you find my laughter funny. Where the people of Portsmouth thought me queer, so their dark miasmas hovered near. Though the public passed with bravado or bemusement to the brightly lit arcade of amusement. Before I finished guffawing like a wanker, tourist wrecked, all ship, no ship, all anchor. The monster from a local myth, a sort of male Pandora's box, but I'm locked inside and the bolt is rusty. Now the whole crate is held in the city museum, low-key brig on the second floor, shelved between candy stripes and false decking for rainy days when the crowd don't stop at Arthur Conan Doyle. Boo! Who is South Sea's real hound? A blue carbuncle, crooked man, the true Moriarty. It's mechanical me. But my evil workings are all at sea. I'm something a matlow never would be. Out of order. Shriek if you want to hear me swearing. 50 D for the F word. These are Jolly Jack's orders. Stop gawping like you've walked off a short pier and come here. Steam up my salt-crusted glass. Don't fear, I'm not going to bust your ass or anybody who ever paid a penny to hear the sailor laugh. Not the dirty old men who were much worse than me. Not the true salts who just heard the sound of the sea. Not the lady who took it quite sensually. Ha! Ah, ah, ha! Ah, not the lady who liked me to please her daddy. Not the family who saw me same time every year and were all familiarity and no fear. Or the groups that took me to heart, took me into their homes and told terrible stories about me. Not the local poppy seller who never spent more than a tear of remembrance, lest we forget at my seaside shrine, this dead man's chest. Not a single hair on their heads will I touch, nor crack their shins with my long john crutch, nor spit in their face with my dead fish breath. They're fine, but which one of you is Jeff? <laughs> you have been chosen by the captain. He's had his eye on you, mate. His other one, what rolls below the black patch, white orb that can see your fate. You have been commissioned by the captain. He's got a job for you, mate. Just pop a pound coin in my slot so I don't have to wait. Day after day, day after day, becalmed, no breath, nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. I must go down to the seas again, and all I ask is, Put the bloody pound in. Those were pearls that were my eyes. Of my bones is coral made. Full fathom five, this sailor lies. The deepest dive off South Parade. Accept money only, please, for I have suffered a sea change into something coarse and strange. Insert the sodding shilling. I'll give you a ship's biscuit, my lucky rivet. Shit, you can have Jolly Jack's foreskin preserved in Jamaican rum. Don't ask me why that cut came there in my ancient mariner's timeline. Or ask me, go on, do, for one of those pretty dimes. Or were you the kind of nipper would stand there and whimper through the folds of your mother's skirt? Well, you're flirting with fortune, because yours is the doubloon will land me back onto the dirt. Yours is the currency will get me flowing first onto my feet in this cramped cubicle. Yours is the ruble will short out the circuit that makes me act jolly. Yours is the yen that will jack it all in. Your magic coin trick 
my fairground attraction, rehash, hey ho, and up I rises. Just put in your cash. Yours is the coinage, Jeff, that will cause a Frankenstein flash. Hey, that's my fist through the screen, still smiling. Ho, that's my boot through the plywood floor. Up I stand with sparks are flying, slashing a portal, scoring a door in this carton, forcing it open, walking the plank, plank into museum moonlight. I must go down to the seas again. First footsteps, bloody, like I've just been turned from a merman, torn into two legs paddling through the building in the deep of night, painted eyes looking for the exit sign, papier-mâché hands grabbing a cutlass from the naval history display on my right, making my way out on a wave of smashé window, an unrigged puppet, a drowned ventriloquist dummy, listing thunderbird of the Solent, watch me rip down Queen Street, crest along King's Road, tack by Hampshire Terrace, still smiling. I walk very slowly though, just before dawn, picked up by CCTV, cross crossing South Sea Common to the lonely sky and sea. Only your Lyra, Jeff, could roll me so far, but it's about to run out, that's the scariest bit, when my tar black humour stops and the clockwork movements carry on. Woo! That's the sp spookiest moment when the creepy soundtrack hops and skips us out of maritime. Only one thing worse than a laughing sailor, and that's a laughing sailor who mimes. So heckle me with a shekel if you don't want to hear my silence. Appease me with your peso if you don't want tonight to end. Not a single hair on your heads will I touch, nor crack your shins with my long john crutch, nor spit in, my, in your face with my grimy saliva. You're all fine. Apart from the one named Jemima, you have been chosen by the captain. He's had his eye on you, mate. His other one, what rolls below the black patch, white orb that can see your fate. You have been commissioned by the captain. His second job is yours. Just pop a drachma in my slot so there's no awkward pause. Jolly Jack has many tales to tell because while I was laughing, I was listening. You know, this isn't even my real voice. It's dubbed by a guy who couldn't swim. Landlubber from Swindon and a virgin. Want to hear a true story, Jem? Then put your half crown in. The laughing sailor once sat at the entrance to the amusement arcade on South Sea Seafront. Well known to residents and holiday makers alike in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, revered as a fabled old tar for some, feared as a terrifying clown for others. He was out of order in the Portsmouth City Museum before I brought him back to life, channeling the voice of this genius loci, this spirit of the place, in the form of performance poetry. I was encouraged to invoke his vintage naval archetype for a research project with supernatural cities. At Darkfest last November, I shared this therapeutic rant in a castle and a tower, longing for the PowerPoint facilities that I'm using today. <laughs> I held up placards and had a puppet which was fiddly in the cold twilight with a script in my other quivering hand. With colleagues from the history department at the University of Portsmouth, I'm developing an app called Portsmouth, immersive storytelling using ideas from psychogeography and a gaming element. We're superimposing a spooky cast and scenario over a local web of history, literary and historical sites. 
At an early meeting, we set ourselves the task of identifying a character or location in this uncanny city and starting to develop its story. As soon as I left Mildam building that day, he popped into my head, threshold guardian of the fun fair. This, vi this heritage attraction cried out to be iconic in our alternate Pompey. As I rushed towards the hovercraft home, I was treading the route Jolly Jack would take, Museum Road, South Sea Common, Clarence Pier. That in the initial pitch I wrote that night pictured his grotesque quest for coins that players might win from a mudlarking scene at the virtual harbour or lose in a sinister press-ganging chapter set in one of the local sailor town pubs. When I started to write the performance poem, the words you just heard flowed pretty fast. Afterwards, I didn't have a strong sense of how long the writing had taken, e.g. how many lines per hour or pages per sitting, which is fairly rare for me. Yeah. There are a few other issues I found particularly interesting about this creative process and would like to discuss also quickly. The sense of a Jungian shadow or animus archetype at play in my work with Jolly Jack. And then in a wider way, what is so scary about the laughing sailor? Why is his legend sometimes monstrous? In a recent, um, one of the sort of, um, his um, uh, old Portsmouth Facebook pages posted his image and there was a huge outpouring of both sort of love and affection for the character and also fear. Um, and, and, and sort of scary memories. So um, that popular response holds, holds lots, of, uh, lots of, of, of sort of info for us also. Um, and then I will finish the, the piece itself. First though, to cite the literary sources that inspired me. Perhaps the most famous lines of sea poetry set the tone and evoked the beat, the meter for my verse, especially the simple ballad structure of Coleridge's The Ancient Mariner when a good south wind sprung up behind, the albatross did follow, and every day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. I also assimilated some sea fever by John Macefield and a bit of Shakespeare's The Tempest. My aim was to twist them slightly so that a mental health note sounded. Carl Jung claims in Man and His Symbols Nowadays, when we talk of ghosts and other numinous figures, we are no longer conjuring them up. My experience of writing about JJ was in fact one of conjuring up. I felt the uncanny albatross wings beating and the dark miasmas hovering near as I started imagining his perspective on the face-to-face-to-Facebook -face -face interactions with all the people of Portsmouth. Tuning into his point of view from behind a glass screen, animated on cue, I resonated with a sense of trauma in the sailor's past. This male Pandora, true Moriarty, locked in a dead man's chest, brought up the idea of PTSD for me immediately. The imagery and vocabulary used in the piece were triggered by my own feelings of unexpressed anger, unspoken fears, unhealthy habits, unresolved urges. It is a very therapeutic rant. In fact, I may call it creative writing, but the process by which I spoke in character as Jolly Jack easily superimposes onto what Jung says about the archetypal shadow and how a person might encounter their own secret or suppressed nature. It seems my repeated act of poetry, essentially a leisure pursuit, matches the way a psychoanalyst would recommend to heal an unhappy split in your soul or your spirit. Jung's close collaborator, Marie-Louise Montfranc, says in Man and His Symbols, when an individual makes an attempt to see his shadow, he becomes aware of and often ashamed of those qualities he denies in himself. The shadow usually contains values that are needed by consciousness, but that exist in a form that makes it difficult to integrate them into one's life. If the shadow figure contains valuable, vital forces, they ought to be assimilated into actual experience and not repressed. So I'm not sure to what extent performing poetry counts as 
actual experience, but I conjure Jack's voice from my breath and his movements with my flesh. Though not planned at the start, this work embodies my heartfelt tribute to him as the muse of a military city, mouthpiece for a seafaring community, and avatar for ex-servicemen everywhere. The physical sensation of being jolly in his claustrophobic sideshow was relieved at the climax when he breaks out of his box. I wrote this bit instinctively, then later realised how neatly it too maps onto a Jungian model in the rite of liberation. Joseph L. Henderson, also writing in the seminal manual Man and His Symbols, describes how ritual acts of initiation, containment, liberation can make it possible for individuals or whole groups of people to unite the opposing forces within themselves and to achieve an equilibrium in their lives. So, ho, hey, that's my fist through the screen, still smiling. Ho, that's my boot through the plywood floor. Try to use rhythm and rhyme to express the tension mounting and the balance tipping between those imposing forces in that part of the poem. <clears throat> Jungian psychology includes a key principle that all men have a female side, known as the anima, and similarly, all women have an inner man called the animus. And Jolly Jack must surely represent mine. <clears throat> Even when Dr. von Franz was writing in the early 1960s, it was not quite the thing for ladies to let their masculine sides show and could certainly be problematic <clears throat> if she seemed possessed by the animus at home or in the workplace. <coughs> the very term animosity attests to this. <coughs> and Jung also says, when the woman is possessed by her animus, she talks too loudly. <laughs> I think that's what I've just been doing now. <coughs> but the theory goes that he too, the animus too, has a very positive and valuable side. He too can build a bridge to the self through his creative activity. <coughs> and <clears throat> they all develop that idea of, of creative writing, of performance, of poetry, of art, of being sort of rit ritualised um, work around, um, around the, um, the self and the, the soul. Here we have... <coughs> The Jolly Jacopolips, I like to think of it. They come from South Sea, from Southport, from San Francisco. There are a few Jolly Jacks around the world who I like to imagine, <laughs> perhaps as a future project, might all escape and come together. Um, <clears throat> there are so far two possible endings to my poem, written for two different site-specific performances in South Sea, Old Portsmouth, during the city's dark fest last autumn. One was at the castle where Henry VIII stood and watched his favourite ship, the Mary Rose, sink. One was at the square tower where, legend has it, a foreign princess first asked for a cup of tea on English soil. Mm. <clears throat> the next stanza of this bonanza concerns that princess, the Portuguese. Get me a cup of tar, char, you filthy tar. Her name, Catherine of Braganza, her royal subject, Tea. She has arrived at the Hot Walls, Old Portsmouth, in 1662 to marry Charles II. Having been accustomed to a cuppa at court in Portugal, she asked for one there, only to be served warm beer. So I've brought, I've brought together that piece of sort of true, uh, true local history and Jolly Jack, as he says. I was the salt that steered her across the Atlantic, mythical mistress of the four o'clock physic. Somehow with her, the high seas turned toxic. Out on the ocean, events became tragic. 
Evil had overtaken our poor ship. Catherine would never loosen her grip on the cup full of filthy tars she scarred. Drinkies every day before the yard arm. Only the darkest brew poured from that bark. An anti shanty the boys alone hark from the crow's nest as the westerly rose and the ship and bounced the ship into the camber, sozzled in Portugal's sludgy amber. In the calm after that rum teacup storm, doing a forlorn hornpipe in the stern, I knew nobody would believe where we'd been. The Queen will leave no tide mark of what she's seen. She made me an addict, not the only one. Many of my shipmates, most of them gone, none of them better than they ever deserved. But Jolly Jack can never die. I am preserved. Every single hair on my head and my smile, my spit and my shins and my suit are pickled. Or I would not be in this box laughing. You would not be devilishly tickled. The immortal blast of my own long john breath keeps me in brine, in a state of brain death. So that is how the Queen's liquor pickled me. How I've been preserved like this for you to see. My problem goes back three, four centuries. And every time Jeff paid a dime to hear the sailor laugh, he funded my crippling dependency. I must go down to the sea again. I must go down to the sea. And all I ask is 20 pence. Your Euro mate, 1D. When preparing to write the poem, I listed all the currency I could think of, shilling, dime, yen, ruble, lira, etc. Then I brainstormed rhymes for each of those words and devised couplets to use for Jack's repeated entreaties to put something in his coin slot. Very professional. But this, um, but this compulsion, a greed, an addiction, a coping strategy, I'm afraid that's personal. I've already told you much more than I'd ordin ordinarily want you to know in Jack's voice about myself, in the war quest and the poetic repetition around an economy of satisfaction and saturation. For Jung, it's merely that I've activated the archetype of the drunken sailor and may notice cases of synchronicity around his myth. Um, I've got a tiny bit more, but have I run out of time? Oh, I've got no sense yes, of time. Yeah, so, just one so, the final synchronicity before I finish, on the way to perform the piece for the first time and suddenly feeling very nervous, I recalled my late grandfather, whose invocation was soothing. Then I remembered that I must have been introduced to Jolly Jack by him, Charlie Carpenter, on seafront walks several times as a child. I thought it strange he hadn't come into my mind sooner as I contemplated the glass case from both sides, as he must have activated the sideshow attraction for me, and I must have stood hand in hand with him as I first saw Johnny Jack chortle and chuckle. But my granddad didn't drink, and he wasn't a serviceman as such, so I can only think that my creative mind allowed me to channel Jack from scratch rather than associating him with a specific person. So for the ending at South Sea Castle, I imagined a resurgence of the crew of the Mary Rose who died nearby in 1545. Somehow Jack's shadowy sense of unfinished business, outrage and resent uh, of resentment at that mass drowning scene, swallowed for ages, had to be spat back. So he describes those drowning men. Into the, into the drink went their rage and resentment. Into the cockle shells went their curses. Into the bladder rack went their cries. Water in their eyes, tobacco in their tins, lice in their fine tooth combs. Tonight's rum still sealed in a barrel. Their lucky sovereigns still locked in a trunk. All bloody sunk at once in the murky, solent water. Blow the man down, boys. Blow the man down. And then, as behoved dark fest, <laughs> They rose again in this hyper-local setting. Mary Rose refugees that only Jolly Jack perceived as another cursed relic from naval law. 500 ancient mariners ahoyed me that summer eve, sightseers from a time-slip sunset on, on the Pompey shore. And where did they go next? Into me, hexed the first likely lad they could see. Along the prom, their essence dissipated. The war memorial was inundated. The sea life centre inseminated. 
I guessed what was coming, sat and waited <clears throat> at the mouth of Clarence Pier, where they poured all their hate and fear into the coin slot you see right here, vomit of antique bilge and dilute beer. And I just had to sit and bide, all the men of, of war within me, roaring like the tide. So that was when my laughter stopped. That's when the council turned me off. Hear no evil, but you can still see him for free at the City Museum. Yes, free to you, but what's the cost to me? What have I lost? Sunshine, shingle, seagulls, pretty girls, passing sailors, a port in the storm, zephyrs hiss in my sails. What will you miss? This snicker, my giggle, the sinister jiggle, candy floss memories, coin slot bliss. Hand over all your money to the poppy sand bloke, because it aren't no joke when the laughing sailors broke. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you just have to see this. <sighs> There we are, five. <laughs> <To finish. laughs> there we go. <laughs>